Welcome to the Michael Reeves Podcast from Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Welcome back, and uh, welcome for the first time, if uh, you've not been before, to Matters of the Heart. And uh, our aim is to look at the fundamental desires, the driving longings of our hearts, to get underneath our behavior to those deep things. And each day, we're, we've got a um, guest theologian to help us. Today, it's going to be John Calvin. But before I um, tell you about him, uh, let's pray. My Father, I pray that today your gospel would prove to be a great liberation for many. I pray that as we get to see your absolute generosity and the way you bring us to securely know you, we might know in our security that we can enjoy you and will not be put away. And so I pray that we would leave here today with great rejoicing in you. Amen. Well, yes, we move um, today from looking at a British theologian, uh, Jonathan Edwards, to looking today at a French one, uh, Jean Covin, he was born, um, you know it was Calvin because he Latinized his name to Johannes Calvinus because he thought Johannes Calvinus sounds cooler than Covin. By the way, everyone did this in their time. So Jean Covin called himself Calvin. Um, Martin Luther wasn't really Martin Luther. He was Luda, but he changed his name to Luther because he thought, thought that sounded more cool. Um, Philip Melanchthon wasn't really Melanchthon. His name was um, Schwarzerd. But he thought, that sounds a bit too German. If I want French readers, then I'll call myself Melanchthon. You know, everyone goes, he's got to be clever with a name like that. So he called himself Melanchthon. Uh, oh, my favorite one is um, a guy from what's now Switzerland, whose real name was Hausschein. And he called himself Echolampadius. Which, you, I, I understand what you're doing there. Anyway, everyone tends to change the names, but um, Covin. Um, not to be confused with Chauvin. He's not the original chauvinist. Um, the, Nicholas Chauvin is a different man. Amazingly, no one was chauvinist before Chauvin. Um, but uh, Jean Covin, he was a French theologian. Now, uh, he moved to Geneva. Um, long story, very quickly. Um, he didn't mean to stay in Geneva. He was basically having an overnight stop. He was on a little trip from Paris to Strasbourg, took an overnight break in Geneva, as you would. Nice chocolates, you know. What? No, not this time. Well, a nice view of the lake anyway. And so he took an overnight break in Geneva, and he was just beginning to be known as a reformer. And the guy who was starting the Reformation in Geneva, the flame-haired and fiery Guillaume Farel, beat down his door and cursed his retirement into a library, which is where he was planning to go. And, and he said, may God curse you if you do not stay here and work on the Reformation in Geneva. And Calvin went, okay. <laughs> so, so Calvin stayed in Geneva to work on the Reformation. He got booted out for about three years and then came back and spent uh, the rest of his life um, in Geneva. Calvin's going to help us think through how to be happy in Christ, which is not the reputation he tends to have John Calvin, the happy one. Now, um, he tends to have the reputation of being morose and bitter. And, all right, true, he didn't just skip through the streets of Geneva giggling the whole time. That, that wasn't him. But I, you understand why, if you know what he's like. And poor guy, especially as he went on through life, had the most horrendous piles and other things I won't mention that made it hard for him to skip and giggle. But he did know a thing or two about being happy in Christ. He did. We'll see it. He used to like referring to himself, and he didn't refer to himself much, but he liked referring to himself as a lover of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? Who are you? I'm a lover of Jesus Christ. 
And he believed that that was very important. So here's something he says. He says, we are to love God for, he says, the worth of good works depends not on the actual good work itself, but on something inside, in the heart, the perfect love for God. He said, a work will not be righteous and pure unless it proceeds from a perfect love for God. So what he's saying, do you see, he's saying, look, you can do a work of, that looks externally good, but it's not actually pleasing to God's eyes if from your heart you don't actually love the Lord. Yeah, that's what's important. Do you actually love the Lord from your heart? Not just performance, but what's going on with your innermost desires. Well, if that's important that we are to love the Lord, and that's what we were seeing yesterday, to enjoy him, how do we get that? How do we be drawn to love and enjoy the Lord? And he says this. He says, it is after we have learned that our salvation rests with God, then we are attracted to seek him. And so we need the promise of grace because in grace we learn that God is merciful. The father is merciful since we can approach him in no other way. Upon grace alone, the heart of man can rest. E.g., how can you be brought to securely, confidently rest yourself in enjoyment and love of the Lord by knowing his graciousness. If you don't know him as gracious, you won't actually enjoy him because you'll think he's simply out to judge you. And you can't enjoy a being like that. So you must know his graciousness. Now, this is, this is basically 1 John 4, 19. Remember? We love because what? Yeah, we love because he first loved us. So if we are to love God, we must first know his gracious love to us. And that his love to us will win a response of love from us to him. So let's see how that works. Well, he starts really helpfully by looking at Christ. Now, he's going to look at the Lord's Supper here, but I just want to look at a few of these words in the middle. In in the Lord's Supper, he says, we see those bits in bold, Jesus Christ. This is the first thing we see in the Lord's Supper. Jesus Christ as the source and substance of all good. Just chew on that for a moment. Jesus Christ is the source and substance of all good. In other words, he is good. He is not a dark Lord. He is good. And he is the source of all good. See, so often I tend to think, I need to manufacture good within myself. I can't. I'm actually empty. But he is the source of all good. And so I must receive goodness from him. He is overflowingly good. Yeah? That's what we need to see. But how then does Christ share his goodness with us? How does that work? Well, he says, he says, And now, if you were here yesterday, this is really picking up on where we ended. He says, it is indisputable. It is indisputable. No one is loved by God apart from Christ. This is what we were seeing at the end yesterday. The father pours out all his love and blessing on his son. Calvin says, this is the beloved son in whom dwells and rests the father's love. And from him, it then pours itself upon us. Just as Paul teaches, we receive grace in the beloved. So the father pours out all his love on his son. And it's only in the son, as the son shares what is his, that we enjoy the father's love. And what I want to try to see today is that, that this being in the son is the secret of enjoying the love of God. Knowing our union, our oneness with Christ. 
Now, this union with Christ idea, being one with Christ, is absolutely crucial for Calvin and for the Reformation in his day. Let me just um, show you very quickly what I'm talking about. Turn to Romans 6. In fact, we're going to flick around in Romans a little bit today. Romans 6. So don't close it when you finish with it. Romans 6. Just notice, here's how the Christian life starts, according to Paul. Romans 6, from verse 3. Don't you know, all of us who are baptized, baptism the beginning of the Christian life, all of us who are baptized into Christ, into Christ, do you see? It's a baptism in which you're united, you're brought into Christ. We were baptized into his death. We're therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the death through the glory of the Father, we too may receive a new life. If we've been united with Christ like this in his death, we'll also certainly be united with him in his resurrection. Okay, I'm now going to show you one slide from Calvin, which I give you permission to skip over because it's a little bit complicated. But it actually unpacks where he's going. So you can fall asleep for one minute if you want. Okay, only one minute. Here we go. He says, yeah, we, the, he, this is how he starts off all his thinking about being one with Christ. He says, we must now see how we get the blessings which God has given his only begotten son. The first thing to be noticed is as long as we're without Christ, as we're outside Christ, as long as we're separated from Christ, nothing which he suffered and did for the salvation of the human race is to the least benefit to us. To communicate to us, to share with us the blessings which he received from the Father, he must become ours and dwell in us. And so he is called our head, the firstborn among many brethren. And we are said to be engrafted into him, clothed with him. And so all which he possesses, as I've said, nothing to us until we become one with him. Okay, if you switched off now, I'm na- uh, uh, you come back. I'm now going to tell you what you just said and unpack it a little bit. Okay, that's what I really want to unpack. What does this oneness with Christ mean? This is how we understand the love of God to us, through this oneness we have with Christ. And to do that, I want to look at the previous chapter, Romans 5. Romans 5. Now, what you get in Romans 5 is something deeply, deeply weird. Deeply weird. Because what we see in Romans 5 is Paul paints a picture of humanity in which he doesn't see us all as this like vast crowd of self-determining individuals. He's seeing nobody actually determines their own destiny. No man is an island. No, in fact, everyone is born into some union. Let's have a look from verse 12. I'll, I'll just race through the key stuff. He says, just as one man, uh, just as sin came into the world through one man, sin came into the world. He's talking about Adam, of course. And death came through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, because all sinned is in the past tense. He doesn't, we'll see as we go through the rest of chapter five, he's not saying death spread to all because we all individually sinned, it's because we all sinned in Adam. Past tense. Let's go on to verse 15 to see that. The free gift that Christ brings is not like the trespass. If many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Verse 17, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And here we go, verse 18, I think this is the key. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. 
For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Do you see? So what Paul's saying is that it's not like we all determine our own destinies. No, it's because of the sin of Adam, ultimately, that anyone sins and dies. It's because of the righteousness of Christ that anyone comes to reign in life. So ultimately, I don't die because of my own sin. I don't live because of my own righteousness. It's quite weird, isn't it, so far? But let's just think, what if that were wrong? What if we are really all self-determining individuals? And boy, is that promoted in culture today, isn't it? In Hollywood, it's just, you determine your own destiny. You're the hero, you know. What, what if that's true, if we are all islands? Well, if the buck stops with me, how does salvation work? If I'm a self-determining island, well, I'm responsible for my own salvation, right? I've got to achieve my own salvation. If, if, it, if, if it's all about me, I have to win my own salvation. What about the other way around? If the buck stops with me and I simply suffer the consequences of my own sin, but I'm a sort of self-contained unit, well, what do you make of the kid born with HIV, the child born handicapped? What do you do with such a case? Because if the buck stops with the individual and disease and death are the result of sin, you've got to say that kid is handicapped because of his own sin. It's his own fault. But we are never islands, according to the Bible. It's not like that. It is Adam who brings about the problem of sin and death. It is Christ who brings salvation. Now, if this all seems a bit weird, it's going to become clear from now, I hope. Okay, flick with me to 1 Corinthians 15. I hope this is going to pop it open for you. 1 Corinthians 15. Reading Romans 5, it does seem quite weird, doesn't it? I think this should start cracking it open for you. 1 Corinthians 15. And um, start seeing this is really very, very good news. Let's go from verse 20. But in fact, Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, first fruits, and then it is coming those who belong to him. Now, to get Paul's argument here, I think it really helps to realize he's got an Old Testament passage on his mind that pops open 1 Corinthians 15. Now, he's hinted at what this is in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4. When he said, do you see, Christ was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Okay, here's the question, which scriptures? He's raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Which scriptures? Let's have a crack at it. Which scriptures? Any offerings? Jonah, great, of course. As Jonah's in the belly of... The earth, three days, three nights, so the Son of Man will be... Um, no, other way around. Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the, in, in the earth. Yep. Any others? That's the third day. Yep. Any others? Hosea. Hosea. Sneaky one. On the third day, he'll raise us up. Yeah. Very sneaky little one. Any other third days? Isaac. Genesis 22. Yeah. That very sneaky one. Yeah. Any others? I don't think it's any of those, really. I think it's the third day he's gone on his mind. Genesis 1. 
the third day of creation. Now just flick with me to it, and I think this really opens up Paul's logic. Now, the third day. Now, just listen for the absurd amount of repetition here. It's as if a point is trying to be made. All right? Genesis 1 from verse 11. God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. All right, all right, thanks, Moses. I think there's a point here. See, these third-day plants, they are the first fruits of creation on the third day. But what is really banged in here, they reproduce each according to its kind, right? Now, how do they reproduce according to its kind? What's the thing that's really repetitious? Seed, exactly. They have fruit in which is their seed. And so the seed, which is the next generation, is contained within them, right? And so where the fruit goes, the seed goes. And so it is, Paul says, with Adam and Christ. They are the first fruits of two very different crops. So Adam is the fruit of death and all in, all his seed in him die. Christ is the fruit of life and all his seed in him shall be made alive. And that is the Bible's understanding of what it is to be human, is that mankind is not in fact this vast throng of separate individuals, but is instead made up of just two men. Two first fruits, primarily, Adam and Christ. And each one of us is just a seed in one of those fruits, dependent for our fate on the fruit in which we're in, the, the head of the body which we're in. And, and so it's a bit, a bit like Adam is the acorn of the human race. And so you do something to the acorn and you affect the whole future tree. And so, declaring Adam guilty and punishable by death, the Lord declares all of humanity, which is in him, guilty and punishable by death, because we're just chips off the old block. Or here's how Calvin puts it. He says, we know there are, so to speak, two fountainheads of mankind, Adam and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with regard to our first birth, when we were naturally born from our mums, we all came out of the fountain of Adam. We were all descended from him. And with, so we're corrupted with his sinfulness, so that there is nothing but perverseness and cursedness in our souls. Sorry, I just paused. Let me just explain that, because that sounds very harsh, doesn't it? There is nothing but perverseness and cursedness in our souls. Calvin is not saying that everyone is naturally really nasty all the time and no one can ever be nice. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, even if you can have this uh, sort of formal external niceness, the problem is you don't naturally love the Lord. And so that is a fundamental crookedness within you. And that will affect all your relations. There will be a crookedness to them. So he's not saying you are always nasty all the time, but every part of you is crooked in that you don't love the Lord. And so you, you, you are in every way affected by the fall. Okay. So it is necessary for us then to be renewed in Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. We can't uncrook ourselves. We need to be made new creatures. Now, let's, uh, another passage for us to turn to. Let's flick to Hebrews 7. Okay. Now, Hebrews 7, just whilst you're flicking to it, let me just give you the background for what's going on here. Hebrews 7, as you turn to it, um, is referring to Genesis 14. Now, Genesis 14 is this time when Abraham goes into battle with some uber baddies. And they really are serious baddies. 
Um, and he manages to whoop them in battle because um, Abraham's so hard. No, he's, he's, got, he's got a lot of fighting men on his side. And, and he beats them in battle. Um, and then uh, he, he takes plunder from the battlefield. And then he meets this glorious king, Melchizedek. And he gives to Melchizedek a tenth of that plunder that he got from the battle. All right? That's the background you need to know. He gives to Melchizedek a tenth of the stuff he's grabbed. All right. Now pile in Hebrews 7. Um, and, and, and here, Hebrews 7, we're going to go from verse 9. Hebrews 7 is really interested in Abraham's great, great, great grandson. I think I got that right. Levi. And it says this, verse 9. One might even say Levi... Levi's the priestly tribe. They receive um, tithes, a sort of tax from the rest of the tribes of Israel. Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, this tenth through Abraham, because he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Huh? It's like Levi wasn't born yet in Genesis 14. Levi was going to pop out in Genesis 38 or so. Um, and so he's still considered to be in Abraham. Yeah, he, he hasn't actually come out yet. And so he's Abraham's descendant. He's Abraham's seed. And so he's still in the old fruit. Right? And so what Abraham does, Levi does. Because he's Abraham's seed. And so it is with Adam, the father of humanity. We were all in him. And so when he sinned and was declared guilty, we sinned and were declared guilty. And so our only hope is, as we were born in Adam, is to be born again in Christ, to be taken out of Adam and grafted into Christ. And so what happens is this. On the cross, Jesus bears the death penalty of sin for us. In him, we bear it. In him. So he bears it as our substitute on our behalf. But we also bear it in him. So we're crucified with him. But it's not like he was actually guilty. He bore it on our behalf. And so the father declares that his son who bore that punishment for us is actually righteous and the righteous deserve life. And so the father on the third day declares his son to be righteous and so gives him life. Now that declaration of the son's righteousness, it comes up in a place like 1 Timothy 3.16. You don't have to turn to it. You can can if you want, um, where it said that The son is justified or vindicated, declared righteous by the spirit. And the effect is that, now this one would be worth turning to, Romans 4.25. Romans 4.25. So he's declared righteous in his resurrection. Romans 4.25 He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Do you see? So he's declared to be righteous. In him, we're declared to be righteous when we're seed in him as the fruit. And so he becomes our righteousness. And so for the Christian, when we're grafted into him, we find our righteousness is entirely in Christ. It's Christ's righteousness, but we get to be in it. So, well, let me, okay, let me, let me make it a test for you. Okay, just discuss with your neighbor for about 30 seconds this definition of justification. Okay, popular definition of justification. Justification is, it's just as if I'd never sinned. All right, 30 seconds, is that a good definition with your neighbor? Okay, any thoughts? Is that a good definition? You can say whatever you want. 
Lots of no's. Okay, someone who's saying no, why not? Why is that not a great definition? Okay, it's not of ourselves, yeah. Our righteousness is not of ourselves. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not as if we, it's just that we've not sinned. It's as if we've always obeyed, yeah. Anything more? There's a hand somewhere else. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's not about us, it's about Christ, yeah. Even more, let's keep pushing it. There's, there's more to be seen, yeah. Yeah, it can make it seem as if we haven't actually sinned, yeah. It could look as if we're never going to sin, yeah. I, I, I think that's absolutely key. It's because we're positively righteous is what we're, we're talking about here. That, okay, if you say, this, it's not entirely wrong to say justification is, is it's as if I, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Here's the problem, though. If you say that is it, you can say, okay, so... You are justified. It's just as if you'd never sinned. Well, that's great. So it's like you've got a forgiveness. Your slate's wiped clean at the moment of conversion. You go, well, that's great. But I've sinned an awful lot since then. So what do you do about the sin subsequent to that? Yeah? And so I, and I think this is how a lot of Christians actually function. They go, well, look, there's this great forgiveness I was given when I was converted but, and at that point, had you shot me when I was converted, I'd walk straight into heaven. The Father's pleased with me. In fact, you probably should have done that. Because what happened after that is I kind of yo-yo in and out of God's grace. Yeah? Because I help an old granny cross the road. Whoa. You know, that topped up the work of the cross, didn't it? <laughs> um, you know, um, I had a quiet time. You know, he really loves me. And then, whoops, sin, he loves me not. I fall out of grace. You know, that, and that's so easily how we operate, isn't it? it? It was just as if I'd never sinned, but now I kind of, he loves me, he loves me not. Hmm, what a lovely gospel. That's not the gospel. It is that Christ is our righteousness. That it is not simply as if, my sin has been dealt with, but I get Christ's own righteousness covering me. So I have his glorious status. To take it out of righteousness language, um, you could use adoption language. All these blessings of salvation were given in Christ. Christ is the beloved son. In him, we are children of God. And so, as the father looks with delight upon his beloved son, so he looks with delight upon me in the son. So, Martin Luther, the reformer who we'll meet on Thursday, he said, sinners are at the same time righteous, uh, uh, Christians are at the same time righteous and sinners. That I'm a sinner in myself and that I'm very, very wayward and fickle and sinful, but I have a righteous status that is independent of my performance. Independent of my performance. I've been given a new identity. I'm a new creation. I've been taken out of Adam, the fruit of death. I'd have been grafted into Christ, the fruit of life. And so like, like seed in a fruit, Christians are hidden in Christ. And so his destiny and status is ours by a gift. We've been grafted into him. And so whilst I am still very spotted with sin and in no way worthy of salvation in and of myself by my own performance, and yet I'm surrounded, clothed with Christ as a seed in him, the fruit. But let me give you Calvin's very superior final illustration. In fact, tonight you can go home and show off to your friends that we were studying Calvin's Institutes, because I'm going to read you a bit from Calvin's Institutes. And people go, that's a terrifying sounding book. You're going to see now, it's very cool. When he sums up in his Institutes, his teaching on justification, Calvin says this. He says, it's like the time when Jacob approached his father Isaac. Now, do you remember the story? Okay, what's going on is Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. 
Remember the difference between them? Now Esau, do you remember, is the firstborn, and he comes out and he is a he's red and hairy. Remember? He's called Edom, which means red. Uh, and he's he's so hairy. Well, we'll see. Do you remember when um, Jacob is going to dress up as him? He puts goat skins on his hands because that'll feel like his brother's hands. I mean, how hairy is this dude? <laughs> goat skins, I mean, man. So he's got, basically got this thick, shaggy red pelt all over him, even when he's born. Oh. And Jacob goes, "That's my boy." And the thing is, um, Esau not only is he red and hairy, so he's really manly. He likes going out and killing animals. So he is going out shooting things. And Jacob thinks, oh, that's a man. And he smells of dead animals. He smells of the field. And Jacob goes, hmm. Whereas, sorry, Isaac does that. Whereas Jacob, Esau's younger brother, Jacob is this kind of mummy's boy, smooth-skinned, who hangs out in the kitchen the whole time. And Isaac goes, hmm, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Now, Jacob, brilliantly, wants the blessing of his firstborn brother. So here's how he does it. This is Calvin now. As Jacob did not of himself deserve the right of the firstborn, concealed in his brother's clothing, wearing his brother's coat, which gave out an agreeable odor. <laughs> He's thinking of all those dead animals. Go, so Isaac would smell it and go, yeah, that's Esau. He, so wearing this goat skins and his brother's coat, he ingratiated himself with his father so that to his own benefit, he received the blessing while impersonating another. And we, says Calvin, in like manner, hide under the precious purity of our firstborn brother, Christ, so that we may be attested righteous in God's sight. And this is indeed the truth. For in order that we may appear before God's face under salvation, we must smell sweetly with Christ's odor. And our vices must be covered and buried by his perfection. Clothed with Christ. Isn't that a great picture of salvation? Clothed with Christ. And so in him, I can boldly approach the throne of heavenly grace and say to the Lord who sits on it, Abba. Abba. And know that boldness and closeness. One of my very favorite verses in the Bible is Isaiah 61 verse 10. Do you know it, Isaiah 61, verse 10? My soul exalts in the Lord. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has arrayed me with a robe of righteousness. And that is how I appear before the Father. So do you see, what this shows us then is that all our hope, all our confidence every day, however we feel, is found outside ourselves, independent of how we're feeling, independent of how we're performing, in Christ. And so if you think that you have or you have lost spiritual security because of how you're feeling or how you're doing, that's because you've lapsed back into thinking of yourself as an island, a self-determining individual. But there is no such thing. You are either in Adam or in Christ. And your destiny and your status is found in one of them. You either have a terrible destiny and status in Adam or securely, freely, as Jacob in Esau's clothing, as seed in a fruit, you have Christ's clothing status. See, here's the thing. I think we can talk about salvation by grace, and we can talk about it strongly, but I think we're going to remain prisoners of spiritual insecurity if we keep thinking of ourselves as islands, 
Yeah? If you think, I'm an island, and so God gives me this stuff called grace to help me along. Because, no, that's just not how it is. If, if I think of myself as an island, I'll think my performance drives my destiny. But instead, all the blessings of salvation are to be found in Christ alone. And there's no hint of salvation to be found anywhere else but in him. He is the vine of God's blessing. And the only way to be blessed is to be grafted into him. You, you could check out Ephesians 1 for a whole, an avalanche of verses to prove that. That the Lord, the Father, he blesses us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Calvin said that Christ received all these good things from the Father for us. That he might share them with us but in him. All spiritual blessings to be found in Christ alone. And so in the Bible, salvation is not so much about each individual being given some stuff called grace. It's more about being snipped out of one plant, Adam, and grafted into another, Christ. Taken out of one humanity and brought into another purely by God's kindness. But with that comes, do you see the absolute security that gives? Absolute security. That, like seed in a fruit, like Levi in Abraham, Christians are hidden in Christ and all his is theirs. Now, with that in mind, I want you to assess something. I'm going to show you something written by... Um, Tom Wright, who was until recently um, Bishop of Durham, and he said this. <clears throat> he takes the, the common courtroom scene of justification. God's the judge, we're standing in the dock, but somehow, standing in the dock, we're declared righteous. How is that? And Tom Wright says, it makes no sense whatsoever to say that the judge imputes, imparts, bequeaths, conveys, or otherwise transfers his righteousness to either the plaintiff or the defendant. Because, get this, this is a brilliant argument. Righteousness is not an object, a substance, or a gas which can be passed across the courtroom. Isn't that a good argument? You go, oh, so how possibly could I have the righteousness of Christ? That's a ridiculous idea. It just doesn't work. Righteousness is not a gas like that that could be transferred from one to another. See the power of the argument? I think it's a very compelling argument. Here's how Calvin preempts him. Calvin says, We do not contemplate Christ outside ourselves from afar in order that his righteousness may be imputed to us, but because we put on Christ and are engrafted into his body, in short, because he deigns to make us one with him. Do you see? So it's not that God has to you know, pass this gas-like righteousness across the courtroom. It is that he makes us one with Christ and declares Christ righteous and in Christ we share what is his. See it? So knowing this union with Christ gives us wonderful security. But there's something else. There's something else as well. Because this union with Christ language is marriage language. We haven't really been looking at that yet, but it's marriage language uh, that the husband becomes one with his wife. So Christ becomes one with his church. And Christianity is a love story between Christ the bridegroom and his church who he's come to win. And this was something absolutely critical in Calvin's day in the Reformation. The understanding that the relationship between Christ and his people is a marriage relationship. And if you've not got this yet, I think you'll find it transforming in your understanding of the gospel. 
The relationship between Christ and the church is a marriage one. Now, here's how it changes things. You see, in medieval Roman Catholicism, Christ had been this very distant figure. So Christ is this distant figure who doles out his grace from afar. And you can only approach Christ through various mediators. Yeah? So Christ is so far off in heaven that, well, hmm, I can't speak to him because he's too glorious. I know, I'll speak to his mum and she'll put in a good word. And what happens is his mum starts becoming too glorious to approach, so people start to approach Mary's mum, Anne, and that's how the cult of St. Anne developed. So you go, well, okay, I'll pray to St. Anne, St. Anne will pray to Mary, and then Mary will pray to Jesus, and then Jesus will pray to the Father. Do you see? So you've got an incredibly distant relationship to Christ with all these mediators in the way. But if Christ is the church's loving bridegroom, how sick would it be to have mediators between the two? Yeah? I would not be happy with that in my marriage. <laughs> yeah. And so Calvin says, he says, this is the folly of popedom. I love words like that, popedom. <laughs> of, of Catholicism. In conceiving all these mediators between us and God. He says, the papists, that was a sort of a rude word for Roman Catholics in his day. And papists were the naughty ones in that direction. Puritans were often considered to be the naughty ones in the other direction, but extreme that lot. And we'll come across a Puritan tomorrow. Um, the papists imagine themselves to be separated from our Lord Jesus Christ, not knowing he's become our brother in order that we might have intimate access to him. Isn't that extraordinary? Christ our brother. That's Hebrews 2 language. In fact, um, one of the most extraordinary names in the Bible, um, you come across it a few times, 1 Kings 14, for instance, is Ahijah. Ahijah, which means the Lord is my brother. What an extraordinary name. The Lord is my brother. Now, Given that closeness, if you don't have lots of mediators between a distant Christ and his church, if Christ is the bridegroom and the church is bride and you have that closeness, then what now does the church want from Christ with this model? Instead of having it this distant model, if the church is the bride of Christ, what does the church want from him? Not something. So even call it grace. I mean, what do I want in a marriage? What, what, what do you want in a marriage? What do you want from your spouse? You don't want just gifts, do you? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. You, you don't just want, oh God, okay, I'm really in it for the roses. You know? <laughs> no, 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 you're in it for them. You want them. You want your beloved. And that's what the church wants. Not something from the beloved, but the bridegroom himself freely offered. That's what we want. And so what this model of being united to Christ, this marriage relationship means, is that Christianity is about being united to a person possessing Christ first and foremost. And so the main benefit of being a Christian is not some abstract thing, but him, himself. Calvin says, we cannot possess the good things of our Lord Jesus Christ to take any profit from them unless we first enjoy him. And that is the very reason why he gives himself to us. Do you see, it's not quite that we get grace, we get salvation, we get Christ and if that doesn't seem glorious to you, press in to know Christ better. Know him to be so gracious as he proves himself to be on the cross. So kind, so loving. We get to know him. So we get a security in our marriage relationship with him. 
When the Reformation started, um, Martin Luther tried to explain the gospel. In his first real attempt to explain at a mass level this, his understanding of justification by faith alone was to talk about a marriage relationship between Christ and the church. And he said, it's like the relationship between a king and a prostitute. And the prostitute can't make herself the wife of the king by being a bit less prostitute She only becomes his when he says, I take you to be mine. And then what happens in the wedding service, what happens is he says, all that I am, I give to you. And all that I have, I share with you. All his blessing, life, goodness, he gives to her. And she says to him, all that I am, I give to you. All that I have, all my death, sin, judgment, I give to you. And there is the great marriage swap of union with Christ. What I want to do now is um, I just want to hand over the last words here to the great 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon. Because I think he kicks home some of the application of this really well, of what Calvin has argued. Here is how to be happy in Christ. He said, It is ever the Holy Spirit's work to turn our eyes away from self to Jesus. But Satan's work is just the opposite of this. Satan is constantly trying to make us regard ourselves instead of Christ. We shall never find comfort or assurance by looking within. But the Holy Spirit turns our eyes entirely away from self. He tells us we are nothing, but Christ is all in all. Therefore, remember, he says, it is not your hold of Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not your joy in Christ that saves you. It is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, as if that's the thing you're doing. It is Christ's blood and merits. Therefore, Look not so much to your hand with which you are grasping Christ. Look to Christ. Look not so much to your hope, but to Jesus, the source of your hope. Look not so much to your faith, but to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. We shall, Spurgeon said, never find happiness by looking at our prayers, our doings, or our feelings. It is what Jesus is, not what we are, that gives rest to the soul. If we would at once overcome Satan and have peace with God, it must be by looking unto Jesus. Yes, my friends, look to Christ, for he is our status. He is our refreshment. He is our brother. He is our bridegroom. And when you see that we've been united to him, when you see we have security in him, the joy of knowing him intimately, then you have an altogether different and joy-filled gospel. Let's pray. My Father, that I could call you that says it all. For you have brought me before you in your Son. We praise you now for Jesus. He perfectly reveals you to be no distant God, but a delightful fountain of love. So kind. And I pray now for my brothers and sisters here that as they press into the Bible, they may hold Christ before their eyes, Christ as their security, Christ as their fixed status, Christ as their clothing before you. And I pray then may they know and overflow with love and joy. In Jesus' glorious name, amen. You've been listening to the Michael Reeves podcast from Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our school of theology equips leaders for ministry. 
Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalisation. And Newton House, Oxford, invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy union books, to discover support for your church plant, or to become a friend of union and support our ministry, visit www.theola.gy.